Hey TFB TV, are guns legal in Thailand? Eh, let's find out. I don't know. I think that's a solid yes. Hey, hope you enjoy this new episode on Springfield Armory. More stuff coming from there. And thank you very much for Interior Munitions for sponsoring these channels. And thank you very much for tuning in. Enjoy the episode, guys. Here uh, at Springfield Armory, we're going to talk about scant stocks, C stocks, and the pistol grips. And we're going to learn a little bit about some of the f what, how the phrase good enough for government work came to Springfield <laughs> Armory in a little bit. So, Alex, please take us away on this whole stock thing. Explain to us. Yeah, stocks get interesting with the O3. Um, here's a funky O3 cutaway model uh, they did for uh, demonstration training purposes. Um, but what we're really focusing on is the grip. And so the very early designs of the O3 was just a straight grip, and that's kind of traditional um, stock shape of the era um, and carrying over uh, into the model 1903. And so by far the majority of 1903s were all in this straight, uh, what the Army called uh, the S stock. And uh, um, so, but later, uh, uh, I guess, experiments and dives into competition shooting actually changed the shape um, of, the sh of the stock itself. Well, to set the stage for you, we're about 1918, just after World War I. And the uh, uh, Springfield Armory goes from a, uh, an employee rate of around 5,000, uh, they were really cranking during the, uh, during the war, um, down to about 200. Um, and that's all full-time staff at the armory. So they really shrunk down and one of their challenges was how do we, um, in what ways do we keep the really talented guys, the guys that we need uh, next time a big challenge comes around um, without having them going off and seeking other jobs. So they found a lot of work and one of the ways they did work was starting to make um, match grade rifles for the national matches and make more or less custom rifles for civilian use available for civilian purchase uh, through NRA and DCM, uh, D uh, the Director of Civilian Marksmanship. And this would later turn into the CMP program, Exactly. Right? Uh, okay. It absolutely has its roots there. And, uh, um, and so they would make uh, really basically the first national match grade uh, uh, 1903s were just uh, regular O3s that they gauged and had really nice tolerances. They really didn't call them national matches or anything like that. They were just kind of tight rifles um, off the line. And, uh, but then post-World War I, they start developing a kind of procedure for making national match grade rifles. And in the process, they're kind of getting feedback. They're going back and forth with the competition shooters at Perry. They say, I like this, I don't like that, what which, works. Which, by the way, Camp Perry actually moved to Atterbury in Indiana recently, about uh, two years ago. So Camp Perry is no longer the home of the, some of the, the matches anymore. Uh, yeah, I think that's a sensitive issue. <laughs> very sensitive. But yeah, please keep on talking. Yeah. <laughs> but Camp Perry um, uh, is where, you know, at this time when the uh, full national matches are happening and the armory would make just batches specifically for issue at Camp Perry. You would show up at Camp Perry and grab a rifle, use it, turn your rifle back in. You had the option to buy the rifle if you wanted, um, but, uh, but basically they were sitting there with a bunch of rifles waiting to be shot and that was the competition at the national matches. So one of the things that ended up coming out was a redesign of the stock. What we've got here is a national match grade uh, uh, 1903. Um, this one was made in 1929 and you can see a little different shape to uh, the stock and they've added this pistol grip. What's the point? What did this help with national matches and what did this actually help? Why, what's the big deal right. that people want to know? Well, really it was about ergonomics and what was more comfortable for competition shooters who were you know, seriously all about ergonomics and returning to position and things like that. And, with, um, and what this pistol grip did versus the straight stock, it, it rotates your wrist. And so it frees up your uh, trigger finger for a little more movement, uh, freedom of movement, um, and uh, comfortability as well. So it was quickly realized that, hey, this is, this is an improvement. 
overall. Mm. I mean, not just for competition shooter. We really ought to adopt this for all the regular service rifles, which at the time was still the 1903 and would be for about another decade. Um, but there was a hitch. At the end of World War I, the U.S. Army had kind of overcommitted to buying stock blanks, you know, just, just rough cut walnut stock blanks to the point where we had hundreds of thousands of stock blanks just sitting here at Springfield Armory waiting to be used. So the Army actually said, yes, let's adopt the, the pistol grip, um, but we're not going to do it until we use up our existing stock of stocks. And so the straight stock would continue, um, but only on new made or competition models, which was where you would see uh, this uh, uh, grip. So the other interesting thing with this is uh, that this configuration effectively was designated the 1903A1. So we first have our changes where the Army uh, effectively said, what makes the 1903A1? It's this with what they call a C-stock. Um, and uh, uh, so with the pistol grip stock, it automatically turns into the A1. But the only new A1s, again, they were making was uh, the uh, uh, national match grade rifles. And uh, um, so that was true roughly up until about World War II. So this is basically the pinnacle of the Armory's development of uh, precision target rifles. Um, there are lots of others, but this is effectively the end game. So we saw the earlier uh, O3A1s, the, the national match regular service rifles, um, where they had free competitions, which they had in the Olympics and other, you know, the Palma uh, matches, other uh, uh, international competition. They had free rifles, so you had a little bit more leeway on what you could do uh, with your rifles. And one of the more popular modifications was adding heavy barrel. Um, barrel covered front sights, so the yeah. sunlight isn't as much. Globe an sights, issue. Lyman uh, rear sights, um, you know, quarter minutes of angle adjustment, and um, really smoothed out, hand fitted actions, um, really smooth action. They polished the inside. Um, they actually scribed the serial number of the receiver onto the bolt, so you know, it would be matched, and because these were hand fitted, really smooth. Um, uh, rifles. They also did things. Actually, one invention by a by some dude named John Garand uh, was a high-speed striker that he developed. Uh, yeah. This one doesn't have one. This one has the normal uh, striker. Um, mm -hmm. But he developed a high-speed striker to improve lock time for competition shooting. This kid, uh, this kid Garand, was that his only invention in the small field I of think small so. arms? That was it. Yeah. Didn't really do much. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, fell off the flash in the pan. I guess. Okay. So, what really killed the competition rifles? you know, the real serious target rifles was basically World War II. And the employment came back um, and the, the competition shooters found other um, sources for rifles. And uh, the armory really turned back towards making standard service rifles. It's still made ma national match grade and would continue in, even until the end. We had national match grade M1s and M14s, 1911s uh, coming out of Springfield Armory through the 1960s. Um, but really it concentrates more on, on the service rifle. Uh, with the adoption of the M1, um, the 1903 becomes substitute standard. Still issued, um, and especially before really everybody gets their hands on an M1, 1903s are still valuable, they're still useful. Um, and, uh, but Springfield Armory wasn't making them anymore. They were making uh, uh, M1s, of course, and so 03 production went out to Contractors, uh, contractors. Right. and one of the bigger contractor in World War II for uh, um, uh, model 1903s and model 1903s um, was uh, uh, Remington and Smith Corona, which is this one's a Smith Corona. Uh, ten points to any viewer who remembers what a typewriter is. <laughs> um, and uh, so they would make these 1903 A3s, uh, new for issue, but you know, if you look closely at this, it's not quite the, almost the work of art that, no. that what it's, Springfield Armory was making with the regular 1903 productions. They, they cut some, not they cut some corners, but they kind of realized how much they could relax their standards. There was a war on. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. And they wanted those M1s being made very, very nicely. And 1903 A3s, eh, not so much. 
So, so going back to the stock, though. Yeah. Yeah. So we've still got A3s, Second World War, because all these stocks are left over. You got and it. We got to we got to put stocks together. We got to put rifles together. So we got the straight line stock. We got the straight right. line stock. But there were new ones. I mean, they used some of the existing things, and they had the option to actually um, make uh, uh, rifles with a straight stock that was still accessible. Clearly. We have straight stocks coming out as new production in World War II. Mm -hmm. The um, Springfield Armory didn't finally use up its supply of stock blanks until 1943. Halfway through the war. Yeah, yeah. when they're cranking on, I mean, they couldn't really, I mean, you compare the stocks of an M1 to a 1903, you really can't mm -hmm. cut them down or anything like that. They were limited in what they could do, maybe make some upper hand guards or something like that. But. Um, but bottom line was, uh, new production 1903s were coming out with a straight stock, but with new uh, uh, stock blanks, they could finally start to incorporate that pistol grip. So they had the scant stocks, and some new production out of Remington and the contractors would actually have that pistol grip, and that's what they preferred. I mean, that's going way back to the, de the decision to really incorporate it. For some reason, uh, the subcontractors couldn't make that pronounced uh, uh, pistol grip. And so the, the ordinance department kind of reduced its standards a little bit and said, we'll give you some leeway in how pronounced that, uh, that grip is. So if we look on the, at the grip of uh, this 1903A4, uh, we've got not, it's not a straight stock, it's not a full pistol grip, it's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, uh, the collectors call the scant uh, grip. And there's, actually, there's a ton of variation on this too. There's, because the con the DOD or the Ordnance Department at the time eventually said, we need something more than a straight stock, um, but we know you can't provide the full C stock, so we'll deal with the scant, which right. would, it, it gives our guys a little bit of a little bit of help in the field. Yeah, right. and it's not just any guys having a standard 03 with this one. These are our snipers yeah. that have to use it. So there's a little bit of that element of competition shooting where you need stuff like that. But they were willing to, you know, again, something improve marksmanship um but uh but again not that that full uh, uh pistol grip